Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this four-part physician-led education series a focus on cancer in the African-American community. This program focuses on breast cancer and is facilitated by Dr. Gore with North Atlanta Breast Care. If this is your first time participating in a Cancer Support Community Atlanta program, we invite you to visit our website and complete a new attendee form to stay connected to all future programs. Welcome everyone to the fourth and final installment of the four-part series of Focus on Cancer in the African American Community, with today's program focusing on breast cancer. I'm Katie Armsby, the Program Outreach Director with Cancer Support Community Atlanta. Cancer Support Community Atlanta continues to offer free support programs virtually to those affected by cancer, which includes a breast cancer support group, triple negative support group, and advanced stage breast cancer support group. These groups meet virtually and are facilitated by a licensed mental health professional. We invite you to visit Cancer Support Community Atlanta's website, cscatlanta.org, where you can find a complete schedule of the virtual events available. As a reminder, everyone will remain muted for the duration of the program. We invite you to enter questions into the program chat box, which will be addressed during the Q&A at the end of the program time permitting. I want to welcome today's program moderator, Dr. Janine Pettiford with the Breast Health Clinic. Dr. Janine Pettiford is board certified in general surgery and fellowship trained in surgical breast oncology. She specializes in benign and malignant breast diseases and is dedicated to guiding patients through the life-changing events her patients face. Dr. Pettiford practices at the Breast Health Clinic where she prioritizes educating the community about breast cancer awareness and focuses on developments in breast cancer research. So with that, welcome Dr. Pettiford, and I'll go ahead and pass it off to you to introduce today's presenter. Thank you. I had the esteemed honor to introduce the Dr. Rylan Gore, who's also a good friend of mine. And so I feel very honored to be able to moderate this presentation today. Dr. Rylan Gore is a board certified fellowship trained surgeon in breast surgical oncology, she specializes in the diagnosis and surgical treatment of both benign and also cancerous breast cancers, as well as breast-related disorders. Dr. Gore is a highly trained physician skilled in advanced breast surgery procedures, as well as minimally invasive techniques as well. She practices with North Atlanta Breast Cancer and has served in the community outreach programs as an advocate to help spread breast cancer awareness. Dr. Gore. Thank you so much for that um, kind welcome. I'm very honored to be with you guys again today. You, a lot of you guys have been rocking with me for the last three weeks of we, as we've rolled out our programs on cancer in the African American community. And I feel very honored to end uh, the series speaking about breast cancer, which is very timely considering October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So without further ado, the presentation will kind of roll out like this. We're going to start with the breast cancer statistics. We're going to briefly review genetics and breast anatomy. We're going to go through breast cancer screening, staging and, tr staging and treatment, and then I'm going to discuss disparities in breast cancer care. And I just want to say, feel free to take screenshots of these um, slides. I want to make sure you guys are aware of everything going on and that you have this information to share. So to begin, I think a lot of us know, but breast cancer is the most common cancer among women and the second overall leading cause of cancer deaths. This year, over 275,000 um, cases of invasive breast cancer will be diagnosed. It's important to note that in these numbers, it often does not include non-invasive cancer, which is ductal carcinoma in situ. And so when you add those things together, over 300,000 cases each year. And so this is extremely important and something that you should be mindful of. Over 40,000 deaths this year and every year due to breast cancer. Breast cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death among all women with lung cancer being number one. And it's important to note that men, you are not immune. For the men in this presentation today, you are not immune. While you only make up 1% of new cases, this is still significant. And I'm gonna discuss this a little bit later in the presentation. One in eight women, one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime. In 2019, this was 12.8% of women, previously 12.4%. A common question, a common complaint I get in my office, 
I don't have a family history. How is this even happening to me? Well, guess what? 75% of women will not have a family history. And so you are not immune just because you don't know what's going on in your family or you don't have a family history. Of those with a family history, only five to 10% of those women will have a positive genetic mutation. Breast cancer in black women. This is very serious because we are 40% more likely to die from breast cancer and this is across all age groups. The traditional teaching was this happens to older women. You have to be 60, 70, 80 years old for this to happen. This is not true across the board. And this is certainly not true for African-American women. Across all age groups, we are more likely to have breast cancer. We are more likely to be diagnosed before the age of 40. We are more likely to have the most aggressive form of breast cancer, which is triple, triple negative breast cancer. And I'm gonna discuss this later in the presentation. We are more likely to present with late stage disease. And across the board, our five-year relative survival is less than our white counterparts, 83% versus 92%. I love this slide um, from the CDC website. And it, it essentially shows white women, that's the yellow um, line. And black women, we're the red line. And it shows that across the board, we are diagnosed at the same rates as our white counterparts. However, when you look at breast cancer deaths, those lines separate and we are more likely to, likely to die from breast cancer. And then of course, the rates for white women and black women are much higher than our Hispanic, Asian Pacific Islander and Asian American um, counterparts. This slide, um, which I also love is easily accessible. The American Cancer Society puts out a usually a yearly report about um, breast cancer statistics. And this is from their 2019 report. And it basically shows that for stage for stage, black women have a lower survival rate. So white women, the, that's the hot pink line. And black women, we are the baby pink line. And it shows that it doesn't matter what the stage is, we're more likely to die stage for stage, whether it's localized to the breast, whether the cancer has spread to the regional lymph nodes or whether we have distant metastasis, we are more likely to die. And so this is something to be mindful of. And this is why we're al always driving in the point why early detection is key. So right now I am the chairwoman of Making Strides Against Breast Cancer. And I was horrified when American Cancer Society put out their report last year because it showed that in six states as of 2019, breast cancer is now the leading cause of cancer deaths. It's not lung cancer anymore, which is the same for um, men and women. Prostate cancer is second for men as far as cancer deaths. Breast cancer is traditionally um, the second leading cause of cancer deaths, but in Arizona, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, and South Carolina, breast cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths among Black women. And so you want to know why we drive the point home and why we're always harping on early detection. This is why. This is why, especially in the state of Georgia. Men, for my men in the room, you are not immune you are not immune. Breast cancer in men, 1% of cases. So in 2020, that will be 2,620 new breast cancer cases. Black men are more likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer. Just like black females, you're more likely to have a higher incidence of all the breast cancer subtypes, and you're more likely to be diagnosed at a higher stage. And a lot of that is just simply, you know, for white men and black men, let's be very clear, you don't think it can happen to you, but it can. This is Beyonce's father, uh, Mr. Na Matthew Knowles. And not only did he get a breast cancer diagnosis, but he is also BRCA2 um, genetic mutation positive, which increases your risk of developing breast cancer. And so this is something to be mindful of and something that you should also discuss with the men in your family. So what are the breast cancer risk factors? Number one, gender. Just by virtue of being a woman, 
by having estrogen and progesterone, you are at risk of breast cancer, okay? The older you are, your age, you're more likely to develop breast cancer. And this increases significantly for women over the age of 65. As I mentioned previously, this is not the case with Black women. We are more likely to be diagnosed before the age of 40. Between the age of 25 and 35, in general, the risk of developing breast cancer is only 2.5%. But again, like I mentioned, and I'm going to continue to harp on it, this is more likely to happen before the age of 40 if you're a Black female. There's always the, always the genetic influence. Inherited genetic mutations account for 5 to 10% of breast cancers, and certain ethnicities are more likely to have inherited gene mutations. The traditional teaching was Ashkenazi Jewish, but what I have found in my practice is that my African American women, Caribbean American women, Eastern European women, they're also pretty likely to maybe have a genetic mutation at some point in their family line. And so genetic testing is very important. Family history. I can't state this enough. I have so many cases. I have a case right now of a 25 year old girl in my practice. Every single woman in her family develops breast cancer and every single woman has had genetic mutation, um, genetic testing rather, and it's been negative. And so I tell patients, all cancers are hereditary, right? There's some kind of flip in the gene that makes it so that your body is more likely to produce a cancer, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's genetic. And so even with gen negative genetic testing, if you have an extensive family history, you are at risk. And so it's important to know that risk. There's the hormonal influence. And so hormone replacement therapy, especially long-term, my little old ladies, they don't like those menopause symptoms. Nobody likes those menopause symptoms, y'all. And so sometimes they are on continuous hormone replacement therapy for 20, 30 years straight, and they always develop these small little tumors that are strongly estrogen and progesterone positive. Not a good idea. Do not pass go. Do not collect 200. You cannot stay on hormone replacement therapy forever. There are other things that we can do to ameliorate the symptoms that you're having from menopause, but hormone replacement therapy is not supposed to be a long-term thing. DES, also known as diethylstilbestrol, is not really something that's common anymore, but back in the 60s and 70s, women were given this to help ensure that they their pregnancies went to term. Those patients whose mothers did have DES are at risk of not just breast cancer, but also clear cell carcinoma of the vagina. And so this is something to be mindful of. And anytime there's any kind of increased estrogen exposure, whether that's you're a woman and you've never been pregnant, you've never breastfe breastfed, whatever, anything that increases your estrogen exposure will increase your risk of developing breast cancer. There are the environmental factors. For example, patients who had childhood cancers, such as lymphoma, and they needed radiation to the chest, you are at increased risk of developing breast cancer. And then, of course, there are the things that we can actually change. For example, our sedentary left lifestyle and not moving around, not engaging in physical activity, this will increase your risk. And alcohol has been shown to increase your risk of breast cancer as well. So, you know, wind down Wednesday is fine, but just don't do it all the time and don't kill the whole bottle of wine when you're having wind down Wednesdays with the girls, okay? What about genetic influence? The most common um, and most well-known genetic mutation associated with breast cancer is the BRCA1 and 2 mutations. This became very popular and a very common speaking point, especially when it got thrusted into the Hollywood limelight. For example, Angelina Jolie was very forthcoming about her personal struggle and her family history of breast cancer and her BRCA1 mutation, which increased her risk of developing breast cancer. And so she actually underwent bilateral prophylactic mastectomies to minimize her risk. And I think that's the right thing to do. BRCA1 and 2 increase your risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. BRCA1, a little bit higher than BRCA2. Of course, you increase your risk of male breast cancer, prostate cancer, 
And then other cancers, such as pancreatic cancer and skin cancer, specifically melanoma. So it's important to be mindful of this. And, you know, since we're talking specifically about cancer in the African-American community, I think it's very important to note that just because you're Black and you have melanin, you are not immune to melanoma. We've seen this happen before in the every, everyday person. We've seen this on the national stage. Uh, Bob Marley died from melanoma as well. And so just because you have melanin, that doesn't mean that you will not develop a melanoma, whether you have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation or not. And so please make sure you're taking care of your skin as well. There are other relevant genetic mutations related to breast cancer as listed below. The most common ones I've seen in my practice have been P10, that is Cowden syndrome, and it increases your risk of thyroid cancer in addition to breast cancer, the PALB2 mutation, and ATM, I've seen that the most often. TP53, this one is just badness all around. If you have this in your family, you, you literally need to watch out for everything. Every single cancer that can possibly happen will probably happen. And so it's important to be mindful of that. But one thing to note, especially regarding P10, PALB2 and ATM, these are considered high penetrance genes, meaning that you have a high likelihood of developing cancer. And I've seen in my personal experience that with the increased number of first and second degree relatives with cancer, your risk also increases. And so this is something that you need to talk about with your physician if it relates to you. So who should get genetic testing? The traditional teaching has been specifically for breast, if you have a personal history of breast or ovarian cancer, you've had two or more cancer diagnoses. Certainly if you have several first degree relatives with breast or ovarian cancer, male breast cancer in your family, and a family history of BRCA genetic mutations and Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. But I'm finding that these rules just don't apply in a lot of my patients. And I've also seen a lot of de novo genetic mutations, meaning my patient has been the first one in their family with the specific genetic mutation. It's important to note that specifically for breast cancer, the American Society of Breast Surgeons, that's one of our organizations that we go to for guidance regarding breast health and breast care. All patients who are diagnosed with breast cancer should have genetic testing available to them. And so it doesn't matter what your age, there are no limitations put on this. Ask for genetic testing because you may have a genetic mutation that has contributed to your risk. And more importantly, if you have children especially, this will also inform you know, their health and their risk factors. And so I encourage all of my patients to take advantage of this resource that we have within our hospital system to address this. Let's start getting to the good stuff. We're gonna start talking about the breast. This is basic breast anatomy. It's composed of several components. Number one, you have the lobules, which create milk the ducts that transport milk to the nipple for the baby. You have lymphatic vessels, and this is very important. You have lymph nodes and lymphatic vessels all throughout the body. But as it relates to breast cancer, the lymph nodes, especially the ones underneath the arm, which you see um, marked out, that's the first place cancer likes to travel if it has traveled outside of the breast. And so this is a very important component of staging. Of course, the blood vessels are an important component of the breast as well as fat, the supportive ligaments called the Cooper ligaments, and the nipple areolar complex. The breast changes over time. I think we all know that. I have patients with nothing wrong with their breasts come in and they say, doc, can you lift them up? You know, that's a normal change too, but there are actually underlying, you know, anatomical changes that happen with the breast over time. When you're a teenager, when you're an adolescent, the breasts are composed primarily of glandular and stromal tissue, the lobules and glands, which I mentioned in the previous slide, very little fat tissue is present. With each menstrual cycle, the breast changes and most patients feel that and know that even if they don't know how to relay that information to their physician with anatomical words. But with the increase in circulating estrogen and progesterone, you have changes in the ducts and the lobules because the body is always trying to prepare for a pregnancy with every single menstrual cycle. With pregnancy, the ducts and the lobules, they grow, they increase in size, those ducts branch, 
because they're trying to get, again, they're trying to get ready for a baby. And of course, with those changes and the increase in size, the breasts become engorged. After menopause, when you all of a sudden have this drop in estrogen and progesterone, that glandular tissue kind of involutes and is replaced by fat. And this is why it's much easier to look at a mammogram on an older woman than a younger woman, because you don't have all this dense breast tissue now in the way. You, it's much easier to see changes in the breast that may be of concern. Let's talk about breast cancer screening. There is a lot of controversy. This is really easy for me, but there's a lot of controversy as it relates to breast cancer screening. If you tuned in to um, the presentation I did back in May on cancer in the African-American community, you already know how I feel about this. I love the American Cancer Society, but as it relates to when you start mammograms, I draw a very hard line. They actually recommend annual screening mammograms at the age of 45 instead of 40. Guess what? For my patients, this is not up for discussion. If you're an average risk woman, you're gonna start at 40 years old. And the US Preventive Services Task Force, which is huge because a lot of our primary care physicians and other providers use these guidelines to make recommendations for their patients, they also recommend you know, starting at 45 or 50. And what's even more appalling to me actually is that the recommendation for starting at 50, you do it every other year. Let's be very clear. The answer to that from my standpoint is no. And every other breast surgeon who I work with, that answer is no. I have so many women in my practice now who are in their 20s and 30s with a breast cancer diagnosis. And so, you're gonna start at 40. That's all I have to say about that. But I wanna make sure you know the information that is out there. Why is this important? It's very important and it's very relevant because over 10% of cases, new cases of breast cancer will be diagnosed in women younger than the age of 45. A 40 year old woman has a one in 68 chance of being diagnosed with breast cancer. That's, that's not insignificant. That's actually pretty pretty huge. And then, even though the risk of getting breast cancer is not increasing for women overall, this is not the case for Black and Asian Pacific Islander women. As you saw in that previous slide, the rates of breast cancer in Asian Pacific Islander women is quite low, but it is increasing. And so this is very important. This um, slide is directly from the screening guidelines from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. And I use their guidelines to inform my treatment and diagnosis decisions for my patients and the recommendation point blank period i got it outlined in a hot pink um, rectangle is that we start for the average risk woman if you're at increased risk it's a game changer the rules change but if you're average risk you're going to start at 40 years old from the ages of 25 to 40 you're going to make sure that you're seeing your physician regularly and that you are making sure that somebody is checking your breast to ensure that there aren't any concerning findings that need further workup. So just driving home the point, repetition is key. You begin screening mammograms at 40 years of age, and this has been supported by several organizations, including the National Comprehensive um, Cancer Network, which I showed in the previous slide, the American Society of Breast Surgeons, American College of Obstetricians and obstetricians and gynecologists, American College of Radiology, and the Society of Breast Imaging. Why is this important? Mammography can identify cancers up to two years before they are actually felt on examination. Half of new breast cancers are diagnosed in women younger than 60 years of age. And routine screening mammography has reduced the number of breast cancer deaths over the last 30 to 40 years by 40%. The data has been updated. This number used to be 30%. But what we know at this point in time is that screening mammography saves lives. So what are we looking for when we get your mammogram? This is, this is really important because I have patients who are like, well, it hurts. I just wanna get ultrasounds every year. Nah, guess what? I'm not gonna allow you to do that. We're gonna figure out ways to make it better for you, but mammogram will pick up things that we don't necessarily always see on ultrasound. 
the big one being microcalcifications, which are a sign, it, it po quite possibly could be benign, but microcalcifications are usually a sign of non-invasive breast cancer, and this is very important. Masses, any kind of distortion in the breast tissue or asymmetry in the best breast tissue. And certainly if you have concerning findings, it'll pick up on multicentric disease, meaning areas of concern, disease in multiple areas of the breast. With increased breast tissue density, mammograms can miss up to one third of cancer. So you may need additional imaging on top of your mammogram. So what imaging do we do? An ultrasound. An ultrasound is gonna pick up on solid or cystic masses. Cysts are very common. Patients come in and they always freak out. I have cysts, oh my God, what's gonna happen? Cysts are completely normal. Welcome to being a woman. Six, if you see 10 women walking down the street, six or seven of them are gonna probably have breast cysts, but ultrasounds will give us a lot of information regarding size of these masses, whether they look completely benign and fluid filled or whether there are other findings of concern that may require additional workup. And then for, those, and for some patients, they may also require an MRI. Who should get an MRI? Number one, this is not recommended for everyone at, or as a primary screening tool. It's expensive and it's very difficult to get approved by insurance some, sometimes. And so it's always important to make sure that you have the prior imaging, your mammogram and ultrasound before you proceed to an MRI. So don't roll up into the office next week talking about Dr. Gore said, I need an MRI. No, I didn't tell you that. You might need one depending on what the, uh, your mammogram and ultrasound finds, but please start with your mammogram and ultrasound. What we do know is that BRCA mutation car uh, carriers certainly need an MRI if you're a first degree relative of a BRCA mutation carrier. If you are high risk, meaning your doctor has done some kind of screening tool, some kind of risk assessment tool, the one I love to use is the Tyra Cusick model, which shows um, you plug in certain data points and it tells you what a patient's risk is. If that's greater than 20%, you will benefit from adjunct surveillance with an MRI. Certainly if you have a history of childhood chest irradiation and if you have dense breast tissue, it's important to note. And one thing that I don't think we pay enough attention to, I have some patients who've done everything they're supposed to do and mammogram is normal, ultrasound is normal, you get an MRI, boom, all of a sudden something shows up. If you have a finding, whether it's cancer or not, that was found on MRI, you will continue to get screened with an MRI because that's how that finding was found, okay? And so that's something to make um, special note of. What about thermograms? I feel like this is a question that's gonna roll through the chat box and I just wanna go ahead and shut it down right now. This week, actually, Ananda Lewis, who was very popular back in the 90s on you know, several TV networks, including BET, she came out and she opened up about her personal breast cancer struggle. She didn't even tell her family um, about her breast cancer diagnosis. And she's been dealing with stage three, stage three disease for two years. And she completely shunned mammograms. She was getting thermograms and seeing her holistic uh, healthcare provider. I really don't know what the right word to use for that, but seeing a holistic um, person regarding her care. And obviously this cancer was caught late and now she's, you know, going back on the back end and trying to get the appropriate treatment. And she still doesn't know actually whether she would even pursue surgery or pursue the traditional imaging um, avenues that we have. I just want you to know, number one, I'm just gonna shut it down right now. Don't do it. We don't recommend thermograms. This is not the way to go as it relates to breast cancer surveillance and diagnosis, okay? Breast thermograms show patterns of heat or blood flow. I want it to be very clear. Most small tumors do not emit heat. They have a very low efficacy among, along the lines of anywhere from 20 to 40%. That's not good. That's not good at all. Do you really wanna have a test that 60 to 80% of the time isn't gonna show you what you need to know? 
I don't think so. It usually misses breast cancer in its very early stages. And if it's actually positive, in addition to the money that you've spent on the thermogram, you're still gonna have to get dedicated breast imaging, whether that's a mammogram and an ultrasound, plus or minus an MRI. So I'm telling you right now, don't do it, don't pass go, do not collect 200. I'm not gonna co-sign it. I don't want a long question in the chat box about, but what if this, what if that? No, not gonna do it. So I wanted to make sure I touched on this in this presentation. So what about diagnosis and workup? How do we diagnose breast cancer? Physical examination, we look at your breast imaging and we always need a tissue confirmation. We need a core biopsy. I think it's so important. I have Drake, I'm a big Drake fan on the side of the screen telling you to know yourself. It is so important that you know yourself. I have so many patients who come to me sometimes with a palpable mass, sometimes not. They've never felt their breast. They don't know what it feels like. They don't know what's going on. And sometimes these are significant masses, significant changes to the breast that they've completely not paid attention to. While, you know, many of many organizations, including the United States Preventive Task Services, will tell you, don't do a breast self-examination. It's not worth it. It's not worth the time. I think it's absolutely worth the time because you get to know you. You get to know what your breasts feel like and what they look like. And even if they're lumpy bumpy, that's fine. Most women have lumpy bumpy breasts with little islands of breast tissue. That's perfectly fine. But more importantly, when you get to really know what your breast feels like, then you know you, you are able to pick out when something is abnormal. And so as you can see, this little cartoon was made by um, a colleague of mine who's also a breast surgeon. Her name is Dr. Kelly Rosso, and she's absolutely phenomenal. But she came up with this cartoon, and I've just been using it all week for everything. But pay attention. Feel your breast. Everybody has a different method of doing their breast examinations, and it doesn't matter what their method is as long as you have a method and that you are consistent with that. Pay attention to the size of your breast and if there are any size changes. Certainly nipple retraction, dimpling, any new rashes, discharge. Don't ignore that. If you notice that, please find your primary care physician or your breast surgeon as soon as possible. As it relates to the primary care physician, I think it's very important to put this in for my PCPs. Um, and other primary care for providers who are in the presentation because they usually see the patient before we do. And so women, you usually go to your ob or your internal medicine doctor first if you're going to the doctor regularly at all. And so it's important to have these encounters and it's important that your primary care physician, they're doing the breast examination because it's very important. And almost 20% of breast cancers are found by the primary care physician. So this interaction is absolutely key. But it's important to note, there's always a but, right? It's important to note that most women will not have any breast cancer symptoms, which is why the screening mammogram is very important. So what are we looking for when you come to the office? We're gonna ask you about your family history. We're gonna ask you if you notice certain changes that correspond with your menstrual cycle, breast pain. You know, of course, we'll breast pain is normal. I do wanna put that out there. But if you can identify a focal area, especially if it's only in one breast that is considerably more painful than, you know, the rest of the breast, we'll probably get some imaging to look at that area to make sure. So be mindful of that. Any self-detected abnormality, masses, skin changes that I mentioned before, dimpling, um, a nipple inversion or discharge. And then of course, trauma. You know, I've had patients come in and say, you know, I was in a car accident and then two weeks later, I noted this mass, it won't go away. I just thought it was a blood clot or whatever. Sometimes trauma unmasks things that we haven't been paying attention to. And so just something to be mindful of. On physical exam, we're gonna be looking for masses. We're gonna be filling for lymph nodes. We are always gonna check the lymph nodes in the neck around the clavicle and certainly underneath the arm in the underarm or axilla. We're looking for discrepancies in breast size, skin changes, 
nipple changes, and the presence of wounds. This doesn't happen often, but I have diagnosed two breast cancers in patients over the last month. They had non-healing wounds of the breast and they had an underlying cancer. So this is something to be mindful of. Your style is gonna vary, just like I showed on the prior slide. It doesn't matter how you decide to do your breast exam as long as you do it and your physician will probably have a certain way that they like to do their breast exams as well. Just make sure the entire breast is being palpated and that all areas, especially the far upper outer quadrant, that you're feeling for those, for those areas to make sure that there aren't any concerning findings. How do we make the diagnosis? Biopsy, biopsy, biopsy. We are not mind readers, we are not psychic. We need a tissue diagnosis to confirm that you have breast cancer or not. And this is done by one of three ways. A stereotactic core biopsy, meaning we use the mammogram to assist us in performing the core biopsy. And this is usually for asymmetries and there's no ultrasound correlate and certainly calcifications or other mammogram findings that are suspicious. If something is found on the ultrasound that they are able to target, they will use the ultrasound um, to perform the biopsy. And also the MRI, if there are findings that we can't see on mammogram or ultrasound, but it was seen on the MRI, then the MRI will be used to perform the biopsy. I want it to be noted that we do not do fine needle aspirations anymore, okay? It feels much better for the patient, the needle is much smaller, but it does not give us the information that we need, especially if it ends up being a cancer diagnosis. The fine needle aspirations usually retrieves individual cells and the pathologist can say, oh, it looks malignant or mm, this looks like a normal cell or just cis fluid or whatever. But in the event that it is indeed cancer, it's difficult to do additional tumor testing that we need in order to plan your treatments. I love this slide because it kind of shows the evolution of how cancer kind of progresses and how it looks to the pathologist underneath the microscope. I want it to be very clear, not every single person goes through all of these steps um, when they get a cancer, but especially for ductal carcinoma, it, it really lays out kind of a groundwork and helps patients to kind of understand what might have happened and why we do what we do. And so on the far left, you see a normal duct. In the middle, you see atypical hyperplasia, meaning some of the ductal cells have grown, some of the internal cellular components are starting to look a little funky, but in general, the architecture of the duct is still the same. I want it to be noted that we do remove these in 20 to 25% of cases of atypical hyperplasia, whether it's ductal or lobular. It will be upgraded to cancer on final surgical pathology. That's not a risk we like to take, and so we generally take it out in everybody. Um, then you see ductal carcinoma in situ, meaning those cancer cells are still confined to the duct and there is no breach of the ductal components. And then invasive ductal carcinoma, where you see that those malignant ductal cells have started to kind of slip outside of the duct. Most patients, they hear invasive and they go crazy. They're like, oh Jesus, oh my God, I'm about to die. Is cancer all over my body? No, this is literally a pathology, a word that we use in pathology to describe the appearance underneath the microscope. Invasive means that cancer cells have started to slip outside of the duct. It doesn't necessarily mean that cancer cells have spread throughout your entire body. And so I think this is something to know, especially for patients from, from an education standpoint. If you need a biopsy, any number of these words may pop up on your pathology report. It's important to note that 80 to 85% of pathology results are completely benign, okay? And so I don't wanna scare you and think that every single person who gets a biopsy, they're about to pop up with cancer. That's not true. One thing we do look at though, especially if the report is benign, is whether it's concorded, meaning those pathology findings agree with what it looks like on your radiology. And so if it's concordant, meaning 
yeah, that looks pretty good. I agree with that. Then there's nothing else to do, at least in the short term. You will probably need short-term follow-up, meaning usually three to six months, where we repeat your imaging to make sure that everything still appears stable. Sometimes patients have a biopsy and those results are benign, but those benign results don't match up with how ugly your imaging looked. And if that's the case, you're going to be sent to a surgeon to discuss removing that area of concern so that the entire area be evaluated by the pathologist. There are certain high-risk lesions that we always like to remove, radial scar, as I mentioned before, atypical ductal and lobular hyperplasia, and then there's lobular carcinoma in situ. This kind of gets mixed up with ductal carcinoma in situ sometimes, but they're actually very different disease processes. Classic lobular carcinoma in situ looks pretty benign. A lot of surgeons still remove it's pretty benign and considered the lowest risk of the high risk lesions. But if it's pleomorphic, meaning things are looking kind of ugly underneath that microscope, it's strongly recommended that it comes out. But it's important to note that LCIS is still considered a high risk lesion. It's not considered cancer. You have the phylloides tumor, which is similar to sarcomas in the way it looks and the way it grows. We always recommend these come out. And then of course, malignancy, ductal carcinoma in situ or invasive carcinoma. So what next? You've gotten your biopsy results and now you're sitting in the office and somebody told you that you have cancer. Number one, we need to get to the business of staging you. Before surgery, this is based on the tumor size, on your imaging, on your physical exam, whether on examination you have lymph nodes that feel positive or are palpable by your physician. And then of course, if there are suspicious lymph nodes on imaging, and if this is the case, these are usually biopsy. After surgery, it's always based on the final tumor size and the number of positive lymph nodes. And certainly if you've had any kind of treatment, some patients do need chemotherapy before surgery, the final pathology will take that into account as well. It's important to note that stage four disease that's metastasis. Metastasis is stage four by definition along. The most common places where breast cancer likes to travel is the bone, lungs, brain, and liver, okay? And liver is usually pretty late stage. The most common is usually bone and lungs. So you get a breast cancer diagnosis. Depending on your particular case, your surgeon or physician may want to, or medical oncologist may want to get an MRI to ensure that there aren't other areas of the breast or anything in the opposite breast that may need further workup. You may need a PET CT, especially if you're stage three or beyond, or if the PET CT isn't covered by insurance, that's a whole nother discussion, your physician will probably order a CT of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, plus a bone scan. What about treatment? Treatment usually specifically for early stage breast cancer stages one and two, we'll start with lumpectomy, which is considered breast conservation or mastectomy. And with mastectomy, you always have the choice of whether you want re breast reconstruction or not. I have a healthy number of patients who really don't wanna be bothered with any kind of reconstruction. They say things like, Dr. Gore, I've been wanting to be flat chested all my life. This is the perfect opportunity. And so, you know, that's a personal choice, but I make sure that I always um, refer my patients to a plastic surgeon to discuss their reconstruction options. Your treatment may include chemotherapy or targeted immunotherapy. It may include radiation therapy. And if you have a tumor that is positive for estrogen and progesterone, female hormones, you may need endocrine therapy. So what about lumpectomy? This is specifically for patients who have small tumors, usually less than two to three centimeters. That's what we feel comfortable with. You have to remember when you're saving the breast, we wanna make sure that we get um, healthy tissue around that. We want negative margins. You don't want to leave any breast cancer behind because this does increase your risk of a breast cancer recurrence. If the tumor is confined to one quadru quadrant of the breast, we do divide the, the breast up into four quadrants, upper inner, upper outer, lower inner, lower outer. If, you're, if you are noted to have breast cancer in more than one quadrant, guess what? This option is not for you, okay? Um, point blank period. And also, 
if you have an acceptable breast size in relation to the tumor size. There are some patients who have small tumors, but they also have very small breasts and doing a lumpectomy will cause severe cosmetic deformity. In those cases, your surgeon may recommend that you actually choose another surgical option, usually some form of oncoplastics or a mastectomy. So with mastectomy, like I said, you have the option of getting reconstruction or not. We do mastectomy in the cases of extensive ductal carcinoma in site two, usually extending across multiple quadrants or mass forming um, DCIS, which I don't see often. If you have multicentric disease, meaning multiple quadrants, some patients will choose mastectomy if they would want to try to avoid radiation therapy. With breast conservation, it is important that you get adjuvant radiation therapy to minimize your risk of local regional recurrence. Some patients don't really want to go through that. It is a time um, drain. And so I have had patients who choose radiation to, or choose mastectomy rather, to avoid radiation. But it's important to note that if you've had prior radiation, especially those patients who have a history of childhood lymphomas or any other lymphomas that require chest wall irradiation, you are not a candidate for breast conservation. And so your option usually is only mastectomy. Large tumors that are not responsive, responsive to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, and sometimes it's simply patient preference. I have patients who have small tumors, but they say, you know what, remove the whole breast. I don't wanna deal with this anymore, just take it off. And in those cases, that is the patient's right. Mastectomy will always include a lymph node biopsy to ensure that there, has, there hasn't been any spread of the, of the disease. Lymph node evaluation. This is an important component of breast cancer surgery because we wanna make sure we appropriately stage you after surgery. A central lymph node biopsy, you will usually receive an injection of technetium labeled sulfur colloid plus or minus injection of blue dye to make sure that we can find the lymph node at the time of surgery. We do this for patients who have lymph nodes that are not palpable on physical exam prior to surgery, or if they have normal appearing lymph nodes on their preoperative imaging. It's usually no more than one to three lymph nodes. I have, in some cases, gotten a few more lymph nodes than three, and that's always amazing to me, to be completely honest. Also, there are patients who do have um, positive lymph nodes pre-op, Maybe they have local, locally advanced disease, but they've gotten chemotherapy first and they've had an excellent response to chemotherapy. In those cases, studies have shown that it is safe to do a central lymph node biopsy. If that's the case, that lymph node will be sent um, while you're in surgery for frozen, uh, frozen evaluation to see if there are residual cancer, tumor, cancer cells. If there are cancer cells present, then guess what? You're gonna go ahead and proceed to axillary lymph node dissection, or at least that's what I do in my practice. It's important to note that with central lymph node biopsy, there is a minimal risk of lymphedema, which is a common concern for a lot of patients after breast surgery. With the lymph node dissection, we do this in patients who have clinically positive lymph nodes or biopsy proven lymph node metastasis before surgery or in those patients who have gotten neoadjuvant chemotherapy and they've had little to no response to um, chemotherapy. In those cases, it's not safe to not do the full lymph node dissection. We need to make sure we evaluate the full extent of disease. It's important to note that in the case of DCIS, I don't know if you remember the chart, but those cancer cells are still confined to the duct, right? And so technically there shouldn't be any spread of disease. So in patients who have DCIS, if they get a lumpectomy, we usually do not do a sentinel lymph node biopsy at the time of surgery because this is non-invasive disease. What about chemotherapy? It can be given before or after surgery. Usually before surgery, we're trying to shrink large tumors and make surgery a little bit more easier on the patient. We do this to minimize breast cancer recurrence. And I will say there are sub certain subtypes, tumor subtypes that will get chemotherapy. Some patients try to dodge it, they don't want it. At the end of the day, it's your body, you can make a decision about what you wanna do. But usually, especially my patients who are HER2 positive, we have immunotherapy that we can give you. If you're triple positive, meaning you're ER, PR positive, and HER2 positive, 
you're going to get chemotherapy. And certainly if you're a triple negative, which is the most um, aggressive tumor subtype that you can have. And like I said, this is the one that usually affects my um, African American patients more, you will be offered chemotherapy. However, we do have tools in our arsenal to help with the job of decision making as it comes to chemotherapy. Right now, especially in 2020, patients want evidence. They want to know why something is good or not good for them and why they should make a certain decision, you know. And so one thing that breast um, cancer specialists that we have in our arsenal is the Oncotype DX test. I love this, I love this test. There are others as well. For example, Mammaprint. Um, they both have excellent patient um, education pages, but basically what this is supposed to do is give you a score to basically try to evaluate your risk for developing breast cancer in the future and determine whether you would benefit from chemotherapy or not. So this picture you see is actually a sample report of what your report would look like if we do um, the oncotype on your test. This is specific to your test. This isn't based to your cancer, I mean. This isn't based on anybody else. Your tumor is sent away to a lab. We test on um, the gene expression of certain cancer genes in your tumor, and then it's gonna spit out a score for us, and that score is gonna be low, intermediate, or high. And based on that information, we can have a real conversation with you about whether you would benefit from chemotherapy or not. Of note, it's important to understand that this is only for tumors that are ER, PR positive, positive for estrogen and progesterone, and HER2 negative, okay? So those are the strict guidelines for that. But it is something that I think it's important for patients to know. What about radiation? It's usually external beam radiation. Quite a few places around the country now are doing intraoperative radiation therapy as well. For those that are getting external beam radiation, so they're showing up to the radiation facility every single day, it lasts anywhere from three to six weeks. We usually try to target the entire breast as well as the lymph node basins to prevent local regional recurrence. The total dose is as stated, approximately 50 grays, and we spread that out over the three to six weeks. Most patients, almost all patients, unless they absolutely refuse, if they've had breast conservation, meaning they've had a lumpectomy, will get radiation therapy. And it also happens in some cases of mastectomy as well. So like I mentioned previously, some patients will get a mastectomy to avoid radiation, but there, but there are some instances where we do recommend that patients who've had a mastectomy still get radiation therapy to reduce their risk of local regional recurrence. Endocrine therapy. This is the usually the last stop in treatments and patients. They're usually happy when they get to this point because they're like, thank God, I don't have to deal with surgery, chemotherapy, none of the other shenanigans anymore. We do this for patients whose tumors are estrogen and progesterone positive. And the whole point is to block your body from trying to create estrogen and progesterone. When you're premenopausal, the ovaries are the primary source of estrogen and tamoxifen blocks that. And in our postmenopausal women, our fat cells and our adrenal glands are the number one um, producers of the female hormones. And so we have what we call aromatase inhibitors. I have some examples below. You may or may not be on these medications or know somebody who's on one of these medications. But that's usually what we do. You will take these drugs from anywhere from five to 10 years. It's not forever. It's not like high blood pressure medication. And winding down the discussion, disparities in breast cancer care. One thing that's important to note is we know based on the data that black women are more likely to be diagnosed before the age of 40. And so the American College of Radiology and the Society of Breast Imaging really looked at this and said, well, hold up. If we know that black women are more likely to be diagnosed at an earlier age, how come we're not screening them at an earlier age? So much like with you know colorectal cancer where the age for black folks was pushed up to 45 from 50 the same has been done for black women as it relates to their breast cancer care and so the recommendation is that starting at the age of 30 if you're at average risk we start to screen you and assess what your needs are and the general recommendation right now is that starting at age 35 you start your screening mammograms if you are an african-american woman now has uh, the insurance companies, insurance companies kept up with this and started to cover it. No, 
but I think this is information that is, that is very important to have. Like I said, I have a lot of women, at least half of my patient panel right now are women of color, whether they're black or Hispanic or whatever, under the age of 40 with a breast cancer diagnosis. And so I feel very strongly about this and I try to do everything I can to advocate for my patients. What are some barriers to effective treatment? There's so many things, right? Everything from lack of access to quality physicians, quality healthcare providers, and quality imaging centers. It's been shown in studies that, you know, minority women and Black women are more likely to go to imaging centers that are not accredited. Health insurance status, we're more likely to not have private insurance or Medicare or Medicaid. Transportation in issues, access to quality food and food deserts physical inactivity and obesity, of course, the genetic influences that we're just now seeing affect not just certain ethnic groups like the Ashkenazi Jewish, but also affect us as well. And there's the general mistrust of the healthcare system. We don't enroll in clinical trials as much, and this has been noted in every single presentation that we've had in this series. And there's so many reasons why, and it's not hard you know, to figure out why. And we can look at Tuskegee, we can look at what they call the Mississippi appendectomies or even the mass sterilization of women in North Carolina in the 60s and 70s as well and see why people, especially black folks, just really don't trust their physicians. But I think it's important to get involved and begin to enroll in these studies so that we can begin to make that change. And then of course, there's nothing the patient can do about this, but the implicit bias on the part of physicians and other healthcare providers. And so I think it's important that if you don't feel comfortable in your patient physician relationship, you are like Dr. Anglade mentioned last week, you are allowed to get a second opinion if that's something that you feel like you need to do so that you can feel comfortable and also feel like a stakeholder in your health. I like to always put this up, you know, kind of going back to my public health roots. We used to call it the biopsychosocial model, but we're really, really moving to changing that to the structural political model. Basically, what are the systemic factors that kind of contribute to our health, you know? And there's so many different things, whether it's biological or psychological, socioeconomic, whatever. These things are very, um, complex, completely honest. And so for my physicians and other healthcare providers in the room, I really challenge you to really think twice when you label a patient as non-compliant. You don't know what they have going on. You don't know what's going on that may really limit their ability to take, limit their ability to take part in their health or ask the questions they need to ask or show up to that appointment on time. And it's something to be mindful of, especially as a lot of these disparities have been completely blown out the water and completely highlighted in the age of COVID this year, which we're all dealing with on so many levels. And so just to be mindful of this as we take care of each other and make sure that we're not putting labels on patients who really do want and need our help so that we can give them the best care that they deserve. What can you do to prevent breast cancer? Every single patient asks me this, guess what? There's nothing you can do. One in eight women, one in eight women, but I implore you to know what your body feels like, do your examination so that you can have a meaningful discussion with your primary care physician or surgeon or whoever that healthcare provider is that you come into contact with so that you can make plans on how to address it. If you feel something, say something, don't ignore it, don't push it off, don't say, oh, I've had cysts before, it's just a cyst. There may come a time where it's not just a simple cyst anymore. And so I implore you to speak up and also encourage your family members and other men and women in your lives to speak up. Please, if you haven't gotten anything else from this uh, presentation, schedule your screening mammogram. And there are factors that you can control. For example, weight control. Overweight and obese women are at higher risk of developing breast cancer because like I mentioned, fat is the largest reservoir of estrogen and progesterone in postmenopausal women. Increase your physical activity, limit your alcohol intake, stop smoking, don't do it. Limit unnecessary radiation exposure. We all have that family member, their pinky hurts and they wanna go to the ER and like roll through the CT scanner. Guess what, you can't do that every other week. Limit your radiation exposure. And if you're on hormone replacement therapy, please be sure to make sure you discuss this with your physician and how long you should be on it and whether you should take breaks or not. And then get involved. 
I encourage my patients to ask questions. Sometimes I'll sit there and just let their just be silence in the room, but I want them to ask questions of me and feel like they are a stakeholder in their health because they are. And so I was so inspired by um, Dr. Anglade's, one of his final slides last week, possible questions that you can ask your physician. So as it relates to breasts, ask about what your treatment options are. Ask about whether you can save your breasts or not and if there's something that you can do to um, potentially save your breasts if you do have a breast cancer diagnosis. Ask about what screening and surveillance looks like moving forward after treatment. Ask about other aspects of your treatment plan and the side effects of your treatments. Insurance coverage is always very important, so I implore you to ask about this as well. If you are uninsured, there are different resources we have, specifically at Northside Hospital where I work, um, to help patients who are in this situation. So please speak up if you have a concern about this. And then always ask about genetic testing as well. And this is just kind of a, you know, a framework, but I'm sure there are other questions you can think of as well. And so pass this along to your family, take a screenshot. If you're dealing with cancer or a new cancer diagnosis, I implore you to ask these questions of your physicians. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. If you want to find me on social media, this is how you do it. And of course, um, our practice website, northatlantabreast.com, or you can go to the Northside Hospital Cancer Institute website and find me. And also, I want to continue to plug my booze, my favorite people, the Cancer Support Community Atlanta. We have so many, so many, so many resources that we have for patients. Like um, Katie mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we have um, a general breast cancer support group. There's a triple negative support group and the locally advanced um, breast cancer support group. And also, we have other things outside of support groups. There are classes, nutrition classes, yoga, tai chi, so many different things that patients can take advantage of um, to help maintain their health, mind, body, and soul. So please go to the cscatlanta.org website for additional information. Also, the prior presentations in our series on cancer in the African-American community, starting with Dr. Glasgow with gynecological cancers, Dr. Aaron King Mullins on, with colon cancer, and then Dr. Ronald Anglade with prostate cancer. Those presentations are now up on the website as well. And so if you miss those, please feel free to go to those websites, to the website and to look at those prior presentations. And then also Northside Hospital Cancer Institute. We have a plethora of, um, resources for patients and you don't have to necessarily be a north side patient to take advantage of the information and the resources we have we have cancer screening skin prostate feel free to um, contact us to get information about whether you qualify for the breast cancer screenings and then also there are clinical trials that are present as well for patients with a cancer diagnosis and then we also have the genetic counseling and genetic testing and they do an amazing job um, helping patients really identify what their risks are. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Um, Pettiford. And thank you so much for listening to me and allowing me to be a part of your day. Dr. Gore, that was an excellent presentation and very, very informative um, and a good just overview of just breast cancer. So we have quite a few questions here. And so one question that I commonly get in my practice is, I was told that my breasts are dense and I have fibrocystic breasts. Does that mean that I'm high risk for breast cancer? Not necessarily. And I don't know what you tell your patients, Dr. Pettiford, but I tell them that you are not high risk per se, but you are at higher risk for having missed findings on your mammogram. And so you may need adjunct imaging, whether that's an ultrasound or an MRI. So dense breast guys within itself don't increase your risk of breast cancer. It's just the fact that depending on the radiologist, depending on where you are, it may be a little bit harder to find some of those findings on your imaging. And so I encourage my patients to push, to push for additional imaging, push for an ultrasound. How about you? I totally agree and, you know, recommend 3D mammograms too. So for yeah. the um, dense breast tissue. So Same. Yeah. And guys, the 3D mammograms, this is a great point. It gives you basically a 3D reconstruction of the breast. So with 2D, your standard digital mammograms, you're usually getting two views unless they see something that looks a little funky and they might get additional compression views. But the 3D mammograms, tomosynthesis, basically creates a 3D 
um, recreation of the breast. And so it's much easier for the radiologist to see whether to hash out if a mass looks like a cyst versus something that's of concern or whether it's, you know, breast tissue that's stacked on top of each other. And this has been a game changer because it decreases the number of callbacks that you get stressed out wondering, okay, what's about to unfold now? And it decreases the number of biopsies. So if you are able to get a 3D mammogram, I highly recommend it. Okay. A question from our um, participants. Can you um, talk about the difference between invasive mammary carcinoma and invasive lobular carcinoma? We were actually just talking about that earlier. <laughs> so mammary just means it started in the breast, okay? Mammary means breast tissue. Sometimes depending on, because you have to remember a biopsy is just a little slice of tissue. It's not the whole area of concern. And so usually somewhere deep down in the pathology report, they'll say whether they see ducts and lobules. So you have a mixed picture or they see primarily ducts or they see primarily lobules. I don't like invasive lobular carcinoma. I'm sure Dr. Pettiford will agree with me because it has a different growth pattern than um, ductal carcinoma. So ductal carcinoma tends to form a mass and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But lobular carcinoma, it actually grows in sheets in the breast versus in the mass. So it kind of, versus in a mass, so it can grow in between breast tissues. And so I call invasive lobular carcinoma the glacier because there's usually a lot more underneath the surface uh, than what's seen on your imaging. And we were just talking about this before we pulled up the presentation. And so lobular always scares me actually. And so as, it, as cancers go, you hate to call a cancer a good guy, but out of the cancer, it is, it is a good guy. It's usually strongly ERPR positive. It's usually HER2 negative. Most of my patients who have lobular usually don't have breast cancer, uh, breast cancer that's gone to the lymph nodes, but it's usually a little bit more extensive than what appears to the eye. And so that's my concern with lobular, not necessarily the words, but just the growth pattern. It's that 15% that likes to hide that doesn't always appear on the mammogram. Yep. That's why we don't like it as breast surgeons. At we like all. to see everything. Mm -hmm. At all. We don't like surprises, y'all. No, we don't. So another good question um, is, are there any correlation or links between chemicals found in hair relaxers or blowout treatments in regards to breast cancer? I don't think he, so regarding blowouts, I'm just going to put that to rest right now. No, no. No, but as it relates to chemicals, and I know this is a very common question because of my patients who are, you know, my Dominicans and my Hispanics and my black patients. And, you know, I've been a victim of the cream and crack my whole life. I love my perms, y'all. I got to keep it straight. Um, the problem with it, there has been an association, but not a clear correlation. And there's a difference. And the problem is that we have these studies, but they have not been trialed and tested. They haven't gone through clinical trials, phase three randomized controlled cl clinical trials where you can really follow somebody for a long time and really state that the perm itself has caused this problem. I encourage patients to be just very mindful of their risks. Um, this, is a, this is a hard one for me, Dr. Pettiford. I don't know about you because we just don't have good data on it to be completely honest. Yeah. And everything is in retrospect. And so it's very hard for me to say that you can't get a perm because it's going to make you get cancer. Yeah, I agree. Or hair dyes. I agree. So we often hear that there is an increased risk of breast cancer with birth control. Um, should I avoid taking birth control if I am high risk for breast cancer? Not necessarily. Um, with birth control, there's ovarian suppression, and so you're kind of minimizing the estrogen and progesterone risk, and so there's actually a slightly decreased risk of developing breast cancer. Okay. This is from Dr. Glasgow. Hey. Um, are there any recommendations for breast cancer screenings that are different for patients who have breast implants? Not necessarily, but one thing I want to um, talk about right now, patients say, well, I have implants, I can't get my breast cancer screening. No, absolutely not. You can get your breast cancer screening and you should still be getting your mammograms and we can safely do that. Obviously, you will be um, advised that there is a small risk of rupture of the implant, but I have not seen that happen in the years that I've been doing this. And the radiologists, they're so smooth. They have so many different techniques they use now to move the implant out of the way so that they can still look at the breast uh, tissue. And so I encourage you 
to still get your breast cancer screening with your annual screening mammograms. And then for those, especially women who have silicone implants, I don't know what your plastic surgeon does or if you're still following your plastic surgeon, but I know that when I was in training, patients who had silicone implants uh, got got MRIs every two to three years anyway, just to evaluate the implant. Because as you know, with silicone, it can maintain its shape, even if it's ruptured. And that's important information to have. So there are things that you can still do. And I encourage you to still get your screening. All right. So this is a question based upon your um, genetic slide. Um, on the list of the genetic mutations that you had, did that list correlate to the most concerned our most dangerous um, or most common um, mutations? No, not necessarily. I think, it's, just I think it's just important. No, I didn't have them in order of increasing or decreasing danger. It's just important to know that there are other mutations outside of BRCA. People only think of BRCA, but there are actually other mutations that increase your risk. And so I think it's important for patients to know that. So if they do get genetic testing and they see that pop up on their report, then they're at least armed with some information and know kind of how to proceed moving forward. Okay. This is the question I get um, asked a lot. So, you know, now it's, it's like mandated um, by law that when you get your mammogram and you have dense breast tissue, the radiologist put that little disclaimer at the bottom that mm -hmm. says that your, your, that your breasts are dense and mm -hmm. that other imaging modality may be recommended. How would you tell your patients to further address that statement? Um, I think it's just important to know what your density is. For those that are extremely dense, and I don't see it often, but I see it enough. If you're worried and you think that there may be something else going on, don't be afraid to ask for adjunct imaging. Um, and that's it. And that's it. Yeah, I guess so sometimes- How do you, how do you usually address that in your office? So sometimes if they're high risk, you know, lifetime over 20%, I'll go ahead and get um, a breast MRI. But I know if, if insurance won't cover because they don't have a high risk, but their breasts are really dense. If we've gotten 3D and if I still question it, I'll just get a bilateral breast ultrasound. Mm -hmm. I do. I essentially do the same. Okay. And so we know that with both of us being here in the Atlanta area, that you know the highest death rate for um, African American women in breast cancer is actually here in Atlanta. And then you mm -hmm. had an excellent slide that illustrated Georgia and the other four states. What are your thoughts? Why do you think uh, um, Georgia plus those other four states are so high in regards to um, breast cancer? I think a lot of it has to do with education and access, to be completely honest. And I hate to say that out loud, but that's really how I feel. That's really how I feel. And we're in a city that's in those other states that I also mentioned, states that are very extremely spread out. When I trained in Chicago and, you know, the downtown, you know, medical district, there were like five hospitals within walking distance of each other. Like if you didn't get what you need or couldn't get what you need from one, you could literally walk across the street to another hospital. Cook County was across the street um, from Rush. And then of course in New York, it's a whole different beast, you know, with so many top notch hospitals in a very small radius. I think that with patients having to deal with transportation issues, like look at how far our offices are from each other and our patients do it and they figure it out depending on what they need, you know, but a lot of people can't get across these barriers and you have to have transportation in Atlanta. You cannot depend on a bus or a train, nor will a bus or a train take you from Stockbridge to Forsyth, you know? And so, and so I think our patients have a lot, a lot more issues that patients in larger metropolitan cities don't have to deal with, even though we are a major city. I think it's access. Okay, I agree. Access and then education, like you said. Yep. Yeah, I totally agree. So in your patients who, um, who have breast cancer, this is a question from the, from the um, participant audience. Um, she's asking, she's had DCIS for five years. So how often do you follow your patients? And like, when should they get their routine mammograms? What is your typical recommendation? I follow my patients for at least five years. For the first two to three years after surgery, the breast that was affected, especially if they underwent breast conservation, you get mammograms every six months for the two to three years and provided that there is stability and no changes, then we can switch to annual mammograms. The non-affected breast stays on the annual schedule. If you've had a mastectomy, I'm seeing you every six months for 
examinations because as we know, mastectomy does not guarantee that cancer won't pop up again. And so I'm examining you closely. And that's usually how I do it. And I think we have time for two more questions. So what is the difference between um, a diagnostic mammogram and a screening mammogram? I get asked that question a lot as well. Great question. So screening, you go in, you get the two to three views of your breast, boom, you're out the door. You get a report within a week's time usually, and usually by the mail. Um, diagnostic, that means there was something abnormal on your last imaging, and usually you wanted to, they wanted to follow you closely, or there's a family history, or you're a cancer follow-up. And so you're getting feedback on the day of from the radiologist. If you need additional imaging, you're getting that on the day of. You're not being brought back at a separate date um, to get that done. Great question. Okay. And so you've kind of touched on this before that we know that in, in the African-American community that we are seeing increased numbers of women being diagnosed with breast cancer under the age of 40. But the issue is a lot of insurance companies won't cover mammograms. So what are your recommendations? You know, <laughs> this is hard. And I, for me, I end up having to sit on the phone with the insurance company and I usually always have to make a case for why this is important. Unfortunately, a lot of the people that come into my office who are under the age of 40 have a finding on physical examination that needs further workup. And so good luck, it's more like bad luck. They end up having to get something else done anyway. And so it ends up getting covered. For my patients who don't have insurance coverage, so many of my patients, one thing I got to say about Northside, that financial assistance has been a game changer for um, my patients, especially my cancer patients. And I can't give them enough kudos for that. And so for the patients who are going through something, they usually end up on financial assistance because it usually ends up being a cancer diagnosis. And I usually have no problems getting imaging. For the everyday woman who really wants to assess her risk, I would probably start with genetic testing if you can get that done. And your, your physician, depending on how much of an ally or advocate they really are, they just have to fight for you, unfortunately. So basically a good take home is don't ignore it. There is help out there. Yep, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. this has been excellent. Thank um, you. Excellent presentation. Um, <laughs> we will turn this back over to Katie now. Thank you both. That was such a great presentation and such a great conversation. I wanna thank everyone for entering so many wonderful questions into the program chat box. Um, and before we wrap up, I really want to thank Dr. Pettiford for moderating today's event. I want to thank all of our previous presenters, Dr. Glasgow with Atlanta Gynecologic Oncology, Dr. King Mullins with Georgia Colon and Rectal Surgical Associates, Dr. Anglade with Georgia Urology, and of course, Dr. Ryland Gore with North Atlanta Breast Care. Um, I want to give you, Dr. Pettiford, an opportunity to maybe share some closing remarks as we wrap up today's program. This is an excellent presentation and thank you for inviting me to moderate. Um, as Dr. Gore has mentioned multiple times in her presentation, you know, education is key and, and also prevention is key. So know your body. If you know something's not right, you know, seek attention from your primary care physician, go see um, a breast surgeon, um, do your monthly breast examinations. That is so important. Don't listen to what the media is saying. Know your body. Mm -hmm. And then if your average risk for breast cancer at the age of 40, start getting your mammograms. If you have a family history, go see a physician, a breast surgeon, your primary care doctor, so you can be evaluated to see if you should get your mammograms prior to the age of 40. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And I do want to just say... Again, if anyone's interested in additional programs, please visit us online at cfcatlanta.org where we have support groups, nutrition programs, uh, stress reduction programs. So as we close up, I do have to give such a special thank you to Dr. Gore for moderating this series. Um, she's done such a wonderful job. Thank you for today's presentation. And Dr. Gore, I'm gonna let you close out this series with your final thoughts. I just wanna say thank you to everybody for just rolling with me for the last four weeks and being here today. I'm so grateful to Katie and um, 
all the folks at Cancer Support Community for just allowing this platform and for us to get this very important message about out about breast cancer in the African American community. Um, a special thanks to Dr. Pettiford. I was just extremely honored and proud when she was able to join us because I look up to her so yeah, like y'all have no idea. I just appreciate you and look up to you so much. And so I'm grateful for you just for so many reasons. And I want to encourage you to hold yourself accountable and your family members accountable and get screened starting at 40. If you have any concerns at all, like I said, if you see something or feel something or think something, speak up. And um, thank you for having me. Seriously. Thank you, guys. All right. I think we're going to end on that note. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for the series. We hope to see you soon and take care. Bye, y'all. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. If you're interested in other live or recorded programs, please visit the online program tab of our website, cscatlanta.org. Or follow us on Facebook. We'll be sharing additional information on upcoming programs.